Hello, gentlemen, barbarian savages. The rooster here. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the generational pacification. Continuing on with my Gyno Planet series, uh, we're at a level of op uh, overpopulation and uh, scarcity of resources. And we're going to figure out right here where uh, generational pacification is going to kind of stretch this out for the elite. And uh, make it last a little bit longer. Okay. So there's a lot of ways that they, over the generations, that they pacify uh, the population. But I picked out the top five that are the most overt and the easiest to see uh, that you can see in our everyday life. And those five are, um, one, the educational system. The pussification of the educational system. Two is women's liberation. Three is chem chemical pacification of our children. Uh, four is the media's emasculation of men. Five is uh, the uh, criminalization of individualism. Okay? So I'll say those again so you can get an idea of what we're going to talk about. One is the pussification of the education system. Two is women's liberation. Three is chemical pacification. Four is the media's emasculation of men. And five is the criminalization of individualism. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, and this all starts with the industrialists of the 1880s, the 1860s to the 1880s. Carnegie, Rockefeller, and the Rothschild families. Okay. These guys uh, were the keys to the Industrial Revolution, but they needed workers. Okay, They needed people that were intelligent enough to be on a spectrum where they came into work every day and they pushed a button, but they didn't want to make geniuses. They didn't want morons, but they didn't want geniuses. So they had to have this little spectrum. So Rockefeller came up, you know, not completely came up, but it, the government was going that way anyways that he would uh, put this into the public school and develop a public school system. A lot of people don't realize this, that Rockefeller was and Carnegie was really behind the public school system because up to that time it was Little House on the Prairie Days. And your neighbors would get together and everybody would throw in $50 for a year and you would hire uh, a school teacher to come out and teach your 10 or 15 families or whatever and you'd have your own little um, school. But Rockefeller was really behind public education because he needed people in the factories and he needed relatively intelligent people that knew math, spelling, you know, could sign their name, stuff like that. OK, now, a lot of people don't realize from 1900 to 1920, Andrew Carnegie and the Rockefeller Foundation spent more money than the U.S. government, they spent something equivalent to like $50 million, a million dollars in each state, which is a lot of money back then, on public education. They spent more money than the government did to get this public education, so they really wanted it. Now, what did they want? They wanted indoctrination of the young. They wanted obedient conformists, people that could take orders, people that were passive, don't question authority, okay? This is the foreman. The foreman tells you what to do, okay? But they needed to start this pacification at a very early age because you got to remember that we were just coming out of the Wild West. People had individual freedom. As long as you had a six gun on your side, you basically did what you wanted to do. And to change that masculine mentality to a feminine mentality, they used the school system to do that, okay? The entire educational system that we have now today, 120 years later, is, as Noam Chomsky says, and has said a million times, is just a huge filter. It is a filter for obedience. Okay, 
Who is going to sit there and do these stupid math problems that have nothing to do with the real world that you're never going to use again in the real world just to get to the next social level? Well, who does that? Women. That's called hypergamy. It's called monkey branching. Every time you did those math problems, you were being trained to be like a female, hypergamous. You're going to do this, and we're going to tell you to do this so that you can get to the next level. Now, did you get educated? Yeah. I did a lot of it. I got a bunch of degrees up there. I did a lot of rope memorization. I went through the whole process all the way up to the Ph.D. level. So believe me. And it does get better, you know, once you get into graduate school. You know, people actually listen to you for your opinions after a while. But, you know, grade school and all that stuff that you did, high school and all that stuff, it's just rote memorization or studying for a test, right? Studying to a test, right? But it's a selection process that filters out anyone who's not obedient. And they have names for people that are not obedient. They used to be artists and poets and create creative people and musicians and stuff like that. But now they're called problems, right? And we'll talk about what they do with that later. But they're selecting for female traits. Female behavior is rewarded. Male behavior is a problem. Passivity is rewarded aggression is a problem okay so you have to realize how over the last 120 years and this is i talk about this the the general subject here is generational pacification this didn't happen like boom all of a sudden we were wild west cowboys and now we have all of these freaking japanese fishmen you know it happened over the last eight generations, okay? Steve McQueen was not like this, but your son is probably going to be a fish man, okay? Because of this. And every generation, they add more and more and more feminism and take away more and more and more toxic masculine traits from the educational system, okay? So that's the first one. Now let me talk about the proof behind this. Okay, these are direct quotes from uh, Rockefeller, Frederick T. Gates, who was the key educational uh, consultant to Rockefeller, said this. In our dreams, we have limited resources. Okay, talking about overpopulation again. Right. And there's how are we going to stretch these limited resources and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. They're basically saying you're docile. We're the elite. We're going to tell you what we want. We're going to mold you into what we need you to be. The present educational conventions fade from our minds. And unhampered by tradition, we work our own good upon a grateful and responsive population. We work, we the elitists, work our own good. This is uh, Eddie the Elitist Eagle, and he says, I'm going to work my own good. I'm going to create an educational system that gets me what I want. And Tommy the Turkey says, well, why can't I learn about Kierkegaard and why can't I learn about Kant and why can't I learn about uh, orators and poets and men of letters and things like that? Because I don't want scholars. I want workers. That's it, man. So I'll keep reading. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers of men. Or learners of science. We are not to raise up among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryos of great artists, painters, musicians, 
nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. We don't want scholars. We want workers. Okay? That is directly from Frederick T. Gates. Okay? And he was the Rockefeller's advisors on the public system. So that gives you the setup to where, where we're at. Okay? Now let's go in to the second part. And this moves all the way up to the 1960s. I'm not going to talk about all the stuff that happened between the 1920s and the 1960s because the next major thing that happened was an opportunistic thing that the Rockefeller Foundation jumped upon. Remember, they know about overpopulation. He's talking about this in the 1900s. And I told you that Maslow's theory came out in 1798. So they knew about it for 100 years before then. They're trying to stretch these resources, okay, for them. Because the planet is getting more and more and more populated and resources are becoming thinner and thinner. They're trying to stretch it. How can they do this? And the way they do this is by implementing female behaviors into men, okay? Second thing that came along in the 60s, women's liberation. And this, a lot of people don't realize, the Rockefellers saw this and they got on board. And you would think, why in the world would they get on board? Publicly, what they put out into the public is this is a noble venture, you know, and women need equal rights and, you know, they need this and the wage gap and blah, 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 and all that stuff. Everybody knows about the women's liberation movement and how first wave feminism started. And if you don't, I've got an entire video on it. So go watch it. Okay. The real reason that Rockefeller, Rockefeller dumped huge amounts of money into this, into the women's liberation movement. Okay. He got them on TV for the first time. He got them in his newspapers. He got them in the Washington Post. He got them into the New York Times. He got this women's liberation movement out into the media so that people could see it. Why? Well, publicly, it was a noble venture. But privately, his real intentions were these three things. At the time... You got to remember, they couldn't get taxes out of half the population. Okay? I know a lot of you millennials don't realize this, but when I was growing up, <coughs> all that mothers did uh, when you were at school was sit around and drink coffee with the neighbors. <coughs> <coughs> Fucking cancer, man. Jesus Christ. Um, you know, that's. The big rollers in their hair. You know, you watch that 70s show. That's not anything like what the 70s were. <coughs> <coughs> the 70s were a bunch of housewives with those floral pattern house coats and their slippers sitting around a coffee pot talking and gossiping all day at each other's kitchen tables. They moved around the neighborhood. They didn't work. Okay. So, and, Carne and Rockefeller knew this. Half of the population isn't working. That means half of the population isn't getting tax dollars. And that means that if they're home, they can raise their kids the way they want to. They can train their kids the way they want to. They're not getting the indoctrination that they, that the Rockefellers want. Right? So that was the first thing. They couldn't tax half the population. So they wanted women's liberation because they knew women's need for social status and money grubbing and gold digging would immediately trigger female nature in their head and they would immediately go to work. And what happened? They did. Boom. They flooded the workplace in the 60s and 70s like you wouldn't believe because they wanted the shiny. Oh, I get a job and then I get my own shiny. Daddy doesn't have to bring me shiny. I get my own shiny. Yay. Shiny. Okay. Also, the second thing. Now we get the kids in school at an earlier age. We can indoctrinate them faster. We indoctrinate children into 
gynocentrism. That's what we're doing. Now, the third thing that they, that the Rockefellers loved about it is not their family, but old Tommy the Turkey's blue collar family, okay, or white collar manager in a factory family, breaks apart their family. Breaks apart their family. Nobody's home for the kids, latchkey kids, all that stuff. And the state becomes, starts being recognized as the family, okay? When you get up in the morning and you see your parents leave for work and you're still eating your cereal before you catch the bus to school and you spend more time with a female state-sponsored teacher, state-trained, state-sponsored indoctrinator, more hours with that lady teaching you all day than you do with your own parents, either father or mother, what do you become? What do you start recognizing as your family? The state. The state is your family. Now, here's another little side bit that people don't realize about women's liberation. This wasn't just industry. This was the government as well. The government, obviously, they wanted the tax dollars, right? Gloria Steinem has talked about this publicly. She's spoken that Ms. Magazine, which was one of the fundamental foundational tenets of the media, for the women's liberation movement was funded by the CIA. Oh, well, fuck the rooster. You fucking conspiracy theorists. No. Go back. You can see interviews. She talks about it. She says it. The government was in on this freaking thing from the beginning. They wanted it. The CIA funded Ms. Magazine. Okay? With the stated goal, and Gloria Steinem understood this, taxing women and ending the nuclear family. Gloria Steinem did not believe in the nuclear family. She did not believe in traditionalism. She thought it was slavery for women. It's actually slavery for men, but she believed it was slavery for women, and she believed in taxing women. And that's why she went, you know, she took this money from the CIA. Okay, proof, love proofs why this didn't work. In the 1950s, illegitimacy was 10% 50 years ago. Okay, having kids out of out of marriage, um, you know, all of that stuff. Illegitimacy now, 50 years later, 90%. Okay, one of the other things that the government instituted to make this illegitimacy and to get fathers out of the house and to make it so that women could have the state as their daddy and have as many kids from different men as they wanted was the welfare system. Okay. There's a law in the welfare system that says you you get your welfare up to until or as such that you have no man cohabitating or living with you. So if you get married, you lose your welfare. If a man moves in with you and cohabitates with you, there's a man in the house or a male role model for your children, you lose the welfare. Okay? Terrible. Awesome for Gloria Steinem. This stuff really happened, guys. You have to understand where all of this came from. Okay? So that's two, educational system and then women's liberation how those two things came about. Are you starting to get a feel for how the, how our world has developed? You know, if you're 20 years old and you don't realize how this stuff happened over the last hundred years, that's why I'm doing these videos, man. So you can live the experience that I've lived over my lifetime. Okay. What's the third thing that came in in about probably the early eighties? Chemical pacification, okay? Not good enough just to train them, train little boys how to be women and how to be passive and how to take orders and not question authority. Now we are going to legitimately medically diagnose them with ADHD or ADD. How do I know this effect? Because... Little boys are four to five times 
more likely, that's 500% more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD or ADD than little girls. How, how, how the fuck can that be? You got a seven-year-old girl and a seven-year-old boy, and this little boy is 500% more likely. Why? Because they want to drug them. They want them sitting on their hands. They want those little boys to be passive, right? And they're not naturally passive. They're boys. They are genetically made to not be passive. But if we can't train it out of them, if we can't beat it out of them, we're going to drug it out of them, okay? And I'm sorry if you were born in 1998 and all of this stuff happened to you and now you're a grown-ass man and you're 21 years old and you can't understand why your dick doesn't work and you don't like women and, and you can't get laid. But this is the reason, because of generational pacification. You're, the reason that you're a pussy is because of all of these things that were done to you without your knowledge. Okay? Um, little boys are 30% more likely to drop out or flunk out because they just don't want to be taught like little girls. It's, it's inside them. Okay. Girls get better grades at all levels. Okay. But still they're treated as if they're victims. Okay. Two thirds of all special education is little boys. Okay. Women get 60% of the degrees now in college, okay? They did a study that, that turned out that even when a little boy does do well, they're not rewarded for it. The grades that are allotted don't correspond with the test scores as they do with girls because girls get artificial, infl in artificial grade inflation due to teachers' bias for women and against boys, okay? And then here's the other side of it. 90% of all of the authority models that are in our public schools are female. 91% of all teachers are female, okay? So if you can't hack the system, you're going to drop out. If you can't hack the system and manage to stay in, your grades are going to be lower than the girls, even if you score the exact same amount, because the teachers are going to grade the girls higher. And if you go to complain about it, you're going to be face to face. You're going to be a seven year old face to face with a 30 year old woman. And you're going to have to have some big ass balls and some big ass intelligence to go up to that woman and say, you know what? It's not fair. You're grading Sally easier than you're grading me. And she's going to say, you know what? Rooster, you're a problem. Go sit in the corner. And you say, fuck you, teacher. Oh, now you're a fucking violent problem. Now you're going to go to the principal's office. Fuck you. Why don't you be fair to the boys as you are to the girls? Oh, now you're suspended or detention or whatever. Okay? So you're in a system as a seven-year-old, you know. I have dreams about this. If I could just go back in time and be a seven-year-old, but have my own intellect that I have now and get in my uh, teacher's faces just for one day in each grade, you know, and say, hey, this is the rooster, but I'm really 50 years old now. I went back in the past and I know what you're going to do to me and I know what you're going to say to me. And here's what I want you to fucking do, because if I ever find you after I graduate from freaking college, I'm going to come and find you and tell you what it's all about. I just want to scare them, them teachers. It would be so fun to be able to have this intellect coming out of a seven-year-old's mouth at some 30-year-old teacher who's trying to, to uh, make me obedient. Okay, so let's go to the fourth one. The emasculation of men by the media, okay? This, you know... The Rifleman, when I was growing up, um, freaking uh, Little House on the Prairie, The Waltons, all those good shows, they didn't have emasculated men on those shows. They had, you know, uh, good, honorable, 
masculine men doing male things and providing for their family in the traditional way, all that stuff. Not anymore. Okay? You have young men being taught that their masculinity is toxic. Okay? Um, on television, all of the freaking fathers, role models, are idiots. In the movies, all of the freaking male role models are weak, little pussies. And on commercials that you see, the commercials, the men, the, the, the men are useless. They can't do anything. They can't program their VCR. They can't figure out how the remote works. There's just one commercial. It's an AR, AARP commercial. No kids. Well, this is a, like a 65 year old man, a 65 year old lady, and they're driving along and the lady says, honey, we need to talk. And you can just, the camera goes over to the guy and his eyes just get big. And he's like, well, you know, you just see the fear. He's shaking because his wife says we have to talk. <laughs> and he just starts spurting out. I took out the garbage. You know, just anything to fucking make her happy like this big fucking pussy. And she's then, of course, she comes with a kind of, no, no, honey, I saw that you took out the garbage. That's fine. You know, condescending to him. And I just, you know, I want to be that guy that's in the car. And I, and it's like, you know, honey, we need to talk. No, not right now. I'm listening to Metallica. You know, just, it just, you know, the, the fact that men are so afraid of women now because they've been taught that masculinity is toxic just drives me crazy. But anyways, if you had idiots on TV, weak men in the movies, and useless men on, on commercials, and you're a 13-year-old kid, how would you feel about masculinity? What would what would it uh, impart into you? Okay, you're being robbed of it. Okay, um, what is this? What does this cause in little boys? Okay, suicide, depression, incarceration. Okay, they don't have any roles. They're being socially manipulated into thinking that they're bad just because. They're men, okay? Now, what I want to tell you is, this is not an accident. This didn't exist in the 60s and the 70s, okay? This bullshit started coming around in the 80s. It's not an accident. The feminization of young men and the brain poisoning of these young men is deep, deep, deep social engineering. This is being done in marketing and advertising departments. They want men to feel like this. They want deep social engineering. And they want men to go out into society and feel as if they are not wanted or needed and they're devalued by women. They want you to feel that every time you walk out your door. Why? Because when you're insecure like that, and you don't understand your own masculinity, you'll try to fill that void with things. And that's what advertisers and marketing people want. They want you to fill the fucking void. They want feminine behavior because feminine behavior is commercialism. Buy, 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 buy. It'll make you feel good. It'll make you feel like a man. They want you to be feminized like a woman to go out and go shopping. To make yourself feel better. That's what this is coming to. That's what it's going to get to. I don't think it's there yet. I still, when I go shopping, I'm in the store for maybe five minutes, six minutes tops. I go in and get what I want. Don't look around. I know what I want. I get it. I leave. I don't linger around and touch stuff and feel the clothes. And when I go buy jeans, I know what my size is. I know what my waist is. I know what my leg length is, I go in, I know what brand I want, I go down the thing, I find it out, I maybe, maybe go in to the dressing room and try it on if I think I've put on weight or lost weight, but usually I just grab two or three sets of jeans and walk out the door because that's how men shop. We don't, it's not the, I don't enjoy it. It's not something fun. It's just an errand that needs to be done. Oh, shit. I need fucking socks. Oh, I need fucking new jeans. I ripped my jeans out fucking pulling the fences. You know, whatever. But that 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 is what 
the media emasculation of men is trying to get to. They're trying to get you to have female behavior so that you'll fill that void of masculinity by buying stuff. Okay? Okay? Um, I'll give you some examples, you know. Who would you rather have as a role model, Marv from Sin City or Homer Simpson? John McClane from Die Hard or Al Bundy? Okay. Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood, or the dude, the fat guy from Family Guy, you know. Um, Steve McQueen from Bullet, Brad Pitt from Fight Club. These are masculine dudes. Or Raymond. From everybody loves fucking Raymond, where his wife fucking leads him around by his nose, tells him everything to do, and he's apologetic for just existing and breathing the air that her and her brood of children have to breathe at the same time. Okay, so annoying to me. Uh, but for a young guy, what you have to understand is it wasn't always this way. <laughs> This is normal to you. They've normalized this feminism, so it probably doesn't even bother you. But someone that's my age who used to watch freaking The Rifleman and, uh, you know, a Y50, the original, stuff like that, this new shit that's on TV and movies and stuff like that really fucking bothers me because I see what's going on, how they're portraying men. If you were born in 1999, you don't know any different. Okay, you don't even know what a freaking Walkman is, right? Because you never owned a fucking Walkman. Everything's been CD since the day you were born, and everything's been feminized since the day you were born. Okay, but I'm hoping somewhere in here you get this feeling that, man, you know, I really, this really bothers me that they're teaching me to be this way. I really, there's something in here that makes me not want to be this way. I kind of like being a man. I kind of want to be a man. I kind of like taking risks and being aggressive. You know, it, it kind of like, I kind of like that. Hopefully there's something inside you for that. Okay. The last one, the fifth one, is the criminalization of individualism. And this is what they do with Everybody who's gone all the way through all the filters, they've made it all the way through, and they can't freaking find any way to freaking change you and make you into a woman, they throw your ass in jail, okay? <coughs> you become labeled somehow. Maybe you're a terrorist. Maybe you're violent. Maybe you're a drug addict. Maybe you're a, you know, whatever it is. They will categorize you. And it will, and your behavior will become criminalized. Okay. Seatbelt laws was the very first thing that, that came along. You didn't used to have to have a seatbelt. Didn't have to wear a seatbelt. Now is it a big freaking deal? Yeah, it saves lives and all that stuff. But fundamentally, at the core of that law, that's the government telling me to do something that has nothing to do with the government. It's my choice. Okay. Seatbelts are great. I always wear my seatbelt. But the law telling me that I have to wear the seatbelt means when I don't wear my seatbelt, I become a criminal. Okay? My behavior becomes criminalized. Weed, drugs, the war on drugs, all that shit that's been going on since the 80s. Okay? Fundamentally, if I want to smoke a big bag of weed, sit in my living room and watch freaking cartoons, watch Ren and Stimpy till I piss my pants. Who gives a shit? I'm the one that's got to clean the piss up, okay? You know, I'm not hurting anybody. It's a it's a victimless crime. But if I do it, I'm a criminal. I go to jail. It's outside of the feminine thing. It doesn't help you get up and go to work, okay? The Rockefellers don't want it to, you know, smoking weed until 4 o'clock in the morning doesn't help you. Drinking and that stuff doesn't help you get up and go to work the next day. So the Rockefellers don't want that. They want you in the factory. Bright-eyed and bushy tail, ready to push that button, motherfucker. Push that button, motherfucker, eight hours a day. Okay, I will push the button. Making widgets all fucking day, right? 
So, prostitution is another one. Prostitution. Prostitution is legal in like half of the world, not in the United States, not in Canada. You know, it is a little bit in Mexico, but another victimless crime. Okay. And the feminists will go, oh, man, these women do, 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 do. and they're such victims. No, they're getting paid and they're choosing to do it. Okay. Nobody's holding the gun to their head and saying, you know, you have to do this. If they don't have any other options, that's a good thing because now at least they have an option. You know, they can go into prostitution and make some money, maybe make their life better. Okay. Um, gun control is another one that they're going to try to to do, and I know that they've already done it in Australia and Canada. They first they start registering and all this stuff, but. Once they put a registration out in the United States that says you have to register all your guns, right? The day before that registration is out, all the guns in my house are legal. I can hunt squirrels. I can hunt deer. I can do whatever I want. I can walk around in my underwear with an M16 over my shoulder, mowing my lawn, do, 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 singing the national anthem out in the front yard. And the day after they require that, and I don't, register my gun with a unique serial number for the government to track it, guess what I become? I become a criminal. And if I then further refuse, I probably will be categorized as a terrorist. And then once I'm a terrorist, I don't even get due process. I don't get a lawyer. I don't get to go to court. I just get to get locked up in Guantanamo Bay for 14 or 15 years without any due process. So you see, what the elites do at the very, very end, okay, is if they can't get you to conform, they turn you into a criminal, okay? By stuff that you were doing yesterday, and now but you know, you're doing it today, it's against the law, uh, you're a criminal because we don't like it, okay? What does this lead to? Social stratification. That's what the big thing that we're fighting right now. Economic stratification, the 99%, the 1%. The uh, elite, okay, they want to control the resources, okay? They're the owners of your country or the owners of this planet, okay? Um, I'm going to, yeah, and, and the whole side of this thing if you really think about this, and I want you to think about this because this is the way it's developed. One side of this, gynocentrism, over here, gynocentrism all the way down here to the elitist Elysium. This whole side is the female side of it, and it's always resource-based or what I like to call uh, um, survival of the richest. Okay? And this side over here is actually natural laws and survival of the fittest. There is a difference between survival of the richest and survival of the fittest. And we'll talk about that later. I'm going to leave you with one last quote before we go off into um, the Elysium part of it and the elitist uh, one, which will be the next one. And this is from Noam Chomsky, okay? He says, personally, I'm in favor of democracy, which means that the central institutions in society have to be under popular control. Popular control. That's by the people. Now, under capitalism, we can't have democracy by definition. Why? Because capitalism is a system in which the central institutions of society are in principle under Autocratic control. Autocratic control right here, Mr. Elitist. Okay? Thus, a corporation or an industry is, if we think about it in political terms, fascist. That is, it has tight control at the top and strict obedience to that which has been established at every level underneath it. There's a little bargaining, a little give and take. But the line of authority is perfectly straightforward. This guy's the boss. This guy pushes the button for eight hours a day and gets a wage. Okay? 
just as as I'm opposed to political fascism, I'm opposed to economic fascism. I think that until major institutions in society are under the popular control of the participants and communities, it's pointless to talk about democracy. And he's right. There is no freaking democracy. There is just the elite 1% that control everything underneath that. Okay? So that's going to take us right into our next chapter, which is elitism and Elysium. Okay? That's all I got, guys. Uh, please leave your comments down at the bottom. I love hearing about it. And uh, as always, take it easy.